Good morning. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Lingo. I'm the interim dean here um, at the University of Louisville in the College of Education and Human Development. Thank you all for joining us today for the Grawmeyer Award in Education public presentation. Each year, the Grawmeyer Award program at the University of Louisville pays tribute to the power of a creative idea. By emphasizing creativity, we celebrate how a single idea can have an impact on the world. Today, I am incredibly excited to welcome the 2023 Grawmeyer Award in Education winner, Dr. Jennifer Morton, to Louisville and to the University of Louisville. It has been an absolute pleasure of mine to get to know and spend time with Jennifer over the last 24 hours. Her husband, Jason, and her daughter, Carolina, have truly been a delight to spend time with. I have learned also in the past 24 hours that Jennifer and I have a lot in common. We are both first generation college students, the first in our family to attend college. And we both are very impacted by the love and support of mothers in our lives. So, with that, Dr. Morton is a, um, an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania with a history of making significant contributions to the field of education. She is a senior fellow at the University of Wisconsin Center for Ethics and Education and has worked at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, City College of New York, and Swarthmore College. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Stanford and has received several awards, including the American Philosophical Association's Scheffler Prize. Dr. Morton received the Grawmeyer Award in Education for her ideas in the book, Moving Up Without Losing Your Way, The Ethical Cost of Upward Mobility, which examines the ethical and emotional challenges faced by first-generation students in pursuing higher education. This groundbreaking work has the potential to transform the way that we think about students, especially the students we serve. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Morton to the stage. Okay, so hope, oh, it still works. All right, thank you so much, Amy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here uh, for the public presentation. It's been such an honor um, to join you and, and the Louisville community and the Grabmeyer family. Um, OK, so let's get started. Unfortunately, we don't have a clicker, so I'm going to have to be walking around a little bit. Um, but we'll get there. All right. Oh, you have a clicker? Oh, OK, no, it's OK. I think I could, yeah, don't worry about it. Oh, oh. I'll just move around. Okay, so um, the, the story of this book starts when I started teaching at the City College of New York, CUNY. And CUNY is well known for being one of those schools that's ranked very high on mobility. And part of the reason that CUNY is ranked very high on, on um, economic mobility is because many of the students that attend CUNY are the first in their families to come to college. Many come from families that are below the poverty line. Um, and most of them are students of color. And when I got to CUNY, um, I had, at that point, always been in, in quite elite educational institutions. My undergrad degrees from Princeton and my grad degrees from Stanford. Um, and and you know, one of the little secrets of higher education is that when you're getting your PhD, nobody really teaches you how to teach, really, in particular elite places. Um, so when I got to CUNY, I was a young assistant professor. I didn't really know how to teach very well, hadn't thought through pedagogy as well. Um, and my students really needed me to figure it out. And in the process of trying to figure out how to serve my students, I really started to think about the challenges they faced in pursuing mobility through higher education and the challenges that I had faced myself as a first generation college student, which I didn't really think about um, very much until later. So in the book, I start with the story of Sandra. And Sandra is really a composite of many of the students I had. 
And this would happen over and over again in my 10 years of teaching at CUNY. Very bright, motivated student would come to class. They would be doing really well, participating, writing their essays. And all of a sudden, uh, things would shift. Um, so Sandra was a student like that. She would start coming to class and kind of like dozing off in class. I was like, okay, she's tired. Uh, not turning in her essays. Um, and then at some point, she just stopped coming to class. Several weeks into the term, um, she came to talk to me. And as we were talking, this phrase that I would hear um, came up. And I would hear it over and over again. And it was that she had family issues, right, or family stuff going on at home. Um, and it was in the process of trying to understand what this meant for my students and how this was a challenge that was impacting their education that I came to the research of the book. Now, we have a traditional narrative of upward mobility in this country in which, and I like this graphic because it's sort of like, you're going to work hard and you're going to move up, right? And you're going to get more and more things. And at the end, you're so happy and joyful. Um, and the thought is that with a little bit of luck and a little bit of hard work, uh, you can move up the ladder of mobility, and critically, that the ladder is one of continual gain, right? The, the higher up you are, the more you have gain. And um, I'm going to seek to disrupt that, that narrative today. Um, and there's already some skepticism about outward mobility. So Raj Chetty, uh, you know, world famous economist at Harvard, um, has has done uh, a lot of research to show that the American dream, as we think of it, children doing better than their parents economically, it's on the decline. 90% um, of children born in the 40s made more than their parents, and um, only half of children now do so. But there are people who make it, um, and as I call them in my book, strivers, uh, people who do pursue mobility uh, through higher education and achieve it. So here we have Sonia Sotomayor, Colin Powell, CUNY grad. Howard Schultz. Um, and, and, and in my book, I interview strivers. I interview people who have made it, who have been successful on this path, to figure out what kind of sacrifices they made in order to get there. Um, so I'm going to tell you today a little bit of the, one of the stories I talk about in the book is the story of Todd. So Todd grew up outside of Atlanta in a, uh, or grew in, up in Atlanta, sorry, in a predominantly black, predominantly low income neighborhood. Um, and he grew up with his grandparents, with his mom and sister in the same home. And uh, Todd went to the neighborhood school as, uh, as his sister did. Um, the neighborhood school had a lot of the problems that we know students in predominantly low income, predominantly black neighborhoods have. Teacher attrition, um, uh, low graduation rates, and so on. Todd was, as he described it, a, a kind of a nerdy kid. <laughs> and he could get made fun of at the school, so he didn't feel like the school was a good fit for him. Um, and at some point, a teacher got stabbed at the school. And his mom thought, OK, that's it. I, I need to figure something out. Um, and so his mom uh, got a friend to uh, let her borrow their address, and she lied, <laughs> to say that they lived in a different part of Atlanta, a more affluent part. And Todd got to go to a magnet school. The magnet school was totally different from his neighborhood school. It had a wealth of resources. Most of the, his peers at this magnet school were the children of white collar professionals, doctors, lawyers, and so on. Um, and so Todd started going to the magnet school, doing really well. He figured out, he said, kind of from listening to his friend's parents and talking to the uh, teachers and college counselors and stuff at his school, how to become the first person in his family to go to college. Uh, he did really well in college and got an internship uh, with uh, the Foreign Service. Uh, after he graduated, he, he went and worked for the Foreign Service for a while. Um, and when I met Todd, he was pursuing a degree um, in, uh, I think it was international relations at an Ivy League university. So Todd's life really went from being born into a low income family, becoming the first person in his family to go to college, um, I, I believe Todd is now a diplomat, right? It's like the trajectory of mobility uh, that, that makes us feel good um, and, and that we like to think about. But what I argue in the book is that things are not as simple. 
So in the book, I discuss ethical cost. And the argument is that in order to gain educational and career opportunities that will propel them into the middle class, strivers often have to make sacrifices in many areas of their lives they find valuable, relationships with family and friends, connection to their community, and, and crucial parts of their identity. Because for many of us, our connection to community and to family and friends are really deep parts of our identity. And I call these ethical costs. The reason I use the word ethical here goes back to my training as a philosopher and thinking of ethics as a study of what it means to lead a flourishing and meaningful life and uh, our relationships with family and friends, our connections to our communities, the ways in which we are embedded in communities are critical, I think, to flourishing lives. Okay, so let's go back to the story of Todd because I told you the, the hopeful uh, version of the story, but there's another version of the story that we should uh, think about. So Todd's neighborhood school uh, had a lot of problems, but it was also the school that his mom, his sister, uh, his grandparents had attended. In fact, it was the neighborhood school that most of his cousins who lived in the neighborhood went to. So he had a lot of extended family in the neighborhood. Um, he said something like 80 or 90 <laughs> extended family members that lived right around him and, and went to the school. Um, his grandparents' home was a hub for the community. He said there were often people from his extended family hanging out. Um, his, his grandparents were very nurturing, and so uh, a lot of his cousins and stuff would come and hang out. When Todd started going to the magnet school, that's when this process of distancing himself from his community came because the school and his grandparents' home was a hub for the community, for this very tight-knit community. Um, and Todd started going to this other school with kids whose families he didn't really know, who are very different from the kids he grew up with or the families he grew up with. And Todd was also kind of embarrassed about letting them know where he lived and what neighborhood he was in. So there was a lot of kind of hiding when they would ask, you know, oh, what about your house? Your family? He, he would try to like evade because he said he, he didn't want um, those families to know where, what neighborhood he lived in. And so he kept these two worlds very separate. Uh, when Todd went to college, he would still visit his, his grandparents and his mom and come back to Atlanta. He was driving distance, but he also had to work to make ends meet during college, so he couldn't go back home as much. And critically, Todd found it hard to make friends while he was in college. Um, he said that academically, he felt fine, he felt well prepared, but there was a kind of cultural disconnect. Um, some of it had to do with money, like he had to work and he didn't really have the time to go do the, some of the things that his peers were doing. And he also um, uh, found it expensive, some of the things his friends wanted to do were expensive, so he found it hard to make friends. But there was this other aspect to it which continued in his internship when he also tried to connect with people there. And he gave me this example that I think really explains it. He said when he got to the internship, uh, at the Foreign Service, he would tell people he was from Atlanta, and they would be like, oh, that's wonderful, I love Atlanta. And then they would name all these restaurants and places they had been to in Atlanta. But this was not the Atlanta he knew at all, because he grew up poor, right? So he hadn't been to these places that like middle class people visit when they go on vacation to Atlanta. And so it would just be really awkward, because they would say that, and then he'd be like, I don't, I don't know any of those places. Um, so there was this kind of disconnect. Um, when Todd started working and making money, he would send money back home to help his family, in particular his sister who struggled at some points with drug addiction and also um, not being able to find work and so on. Uh, but his sister thought it was never enough, that she always needed money. And so they had this very difficult relationship in virtue of the fact that he was making money and she was struggling, where every time he would call home, they would get into arguments. And so he stopped calling home as much. At some point, his grandparents passed away. Um, so he started uh, visiting home less. And he experienced this distance from his family and his community over time. And at the same time, was finding it hard to find a community um, and those deep connections in these new spaces that he was in. So in the book, um, I, I argue that ethical goods are those aspects of our lives that we value and give it meaning. As I said, what we might think of as contributing to our flourishing. And for strivers, 
those goods, um, the ethical goods at stake, are often those precise aspects of our lives that contribute to our flourishing. Relationships with family and friends, connection to community and sense of identity. Um, and, and strivers risk undermining or losing some of those ethical goods for the sake of those educational and career opportunities. And we see in the, this in the case of Todd. Um, and the case of Todd is, is sort of an extreme example of the ways in which these relationships get frayed. But it was something that I saw every day when I taught at CUNY with my students, who would often be in the position of having to care for family members in different ways. So some students worked, so I had a, uh, just, you know, I have so many examples, but one example, a student whose mom became disabled, so uh, she worked full time to try to support her family because disability wasn't enough for them, and she was going to school full time, right? And there was often this kind of feeling torn between those two things or uh, students who would step in and help with uh, child care or elder care when um, a family or an extended family member needed. And so they experienced this conflict between um, two parts of their lives they found valuable and meaningful. One, their own individual advancement in education and career, um, and as well as being there for their families and those connections. Um, Now, one thing that you might think, um, and that actually a lot of my colleagues and I myself thought at first, was that we can think of these costs as investments, in a way. So, uh, like, for example, college students often take on debt to go to college, right? And that's not great. Uh, but what we often tell students is, you will make more money down the line, and that will make up for the debt that you took. You know, you'll be able to pay it back and then some. You'll make more. So it's an investment in your future. Now you might think that uh, the student who's having a hard time saying no to their family when they're trying to pursue education um, might be able to think about it this way. And this is what we used to tell our students. Look, down the line, your family will be better off if you end up getting this degree and prioritizing your education, right? But I'm going to suggest that we can't quite account for these sorts of goods in that way. Um, so why not? This goes back to a notion um, in philosophy that we use when we're talking about love and the philosophy of love and caring, which is that the people that we love and the relationships we have are often irreplaceable. So money is fungible, um, and that's a, you know some of you who might remember Econ 101. Uh, if you have debt now and then you pay it back later, it's made whole, right? Uh, the fact that you have $10 now uh, or that you have $11 later, you know, if you account for interest and so on, uh, it, the, the particular bills don't matter, right? Like that it's this particular $10 bill. But when it comes to relationships, we often don't think of them as fungible in that way. If you lose a relationship now or that relationship gets damaged, the fact that you then go on to have other relationships, so take the case of Todd. Todd has a family now, a spouse, children. The fact that he has his own family doesn't mean that that replaces the loss he experienced in his own connection with his birth family, right, with his sister, uh, with his mother, and so on. Those losses still remain with him, even as he now has his own family. We can't think of friendships or relationships that are meaningful to us as just being fungible and easily replaced, which means that a loss now, a relationship that comes, becomes frayed now, maybe can be repaired later, but there's no guarantees. And it's not like being able to make money later will make up for that loss necessarily, right? And so, um, Strivers often sit with this kind of guilt and regret about some other relationships they make. So one question I have is, well, so that's, you know, that's an interesting aspect of the experience of strivers, but don't all college students make trade-offs? Um, especially if you're more economically minded, you might think this can all be thought about in that way. But I'm going to suggest here that these ethical costs are disproportionately borne by students from disadvantaged communities because of unjust economic, social, and cultural factors that are beyond their control. And I spent a fair amount of time in the book uh, going over this, so I'm just going to go over it quickly. 
There are three factors in particular that we see play out, and I'm going to tell you a little bit how they play out in Todd's story from the beginning. Um, so we know from uh, decades of research, uh, this is a quote, I won't read it, from the UCLA and Civil Rights Project, um, but we know that schools in predominantly low income, predominantly minority neighborhoods tend to have the problems that uh, other schools don't share, so less qualified teachers, uh, you know, different kinds of parental influence over uh, the curriculum and over the, the, the school, um, lower graduation rates, fewer AP classes. There's all sorts of things that um, affect the, the quality of schools in such neighborhoods. Now, we see this play out in the distancing that Todd experiences from the very beginning, right? Because Todd's mom has to find a school in a different neighborhood than hers because there's no option in her neighborhood for Todd to be on that path to college, right? Most of the kids in his neighborhood school were not even going to graduate high school, and some of them might, but they weren't going to go to college in the way that he did. I mean, maybe he could have found a way, but it would have been the exception. Whereas him going to this magnet school basically guaranteed that he was going to go to college, right? Um, but what Todd's mom didn't have the option to do was send her kid to a neighborhood school where she knew the families, where they were part of the same community. That gave him opportunities for mobility. She couldn't get both of those things in the same school, right? So she had to send her kid elsewhere and start this distancing process. Whereas for more affluent families, sending their kid to the neighborhood school is a choice, and it's a choice to send their kid to the neighborhood school with families say no, families from the neighborhood, and still be pretty certain that their kid will have a good chance to go to college. Um, that was not an option for Todd's mom, and we can trace this back to the way in which the geography of opportunity happens in this country. Another aspect, and here's another Grabmeyer winner from the past, uh, Sarah Golder Rock's book, Paying the Price, which I highly recommend and has really influenced my thinking on this, which is that when the safety net is inadequate, that burden often falls on college students. And that's something we don't think about often, um, but Sarah Golder Rock talks about this in her book with a case that, similar to a case I encountered in my teaching of NEMA, who goes to college to have a better life than her parents, but her dad is disabled. She wants to earn a college degree to help her family have a better life, but the family cannot survive losing her wages as she pursues school, and so she's working full time, trying to go to school full time, and not really doing very well at either, um, and feeling this torn. And, and in the background, we see here that the system of disability insurance is failing her family. Right? Because if her dad actually had um, enough money that they could do without Nemo's wages, she wouldn't really be in this situation. We see this also with Todd. So Todd's sister was struggling. And the only person she felt she could turn to was him. Because he's the only person she knew who, who had any sort of money. right? Um, and so it, since she couldn't turn to the um, uh, safety net, or it wasn't sufficient for her, she turned to her brother, and this created a tension between them that further distanced them. The final element is that of cultural mismatch. Uh, this is Nicole Stevens and her collaborators at Northwestern. Uh, she's looked at the ways in which first-generation college students often have an interdependent cultural model, whereas selective college campuses are often dominated by independent cultural model. And she thinks this mismatch between the cultural models makes it hard for students to navigate and succeed in college. Just like explain this a little bit more. Um, so maybe take a minute and think, what do you think are reasons that students go to college? Maybe that you went to college yourself. So what um, Stevens will do is she will ask this question of faculty, students, and administrators at a campus. And here are different sorts of reasons that people give. So if you're more on the interdependent side, which is the side that first-gen uh, college students often are, you will think, help my family out after I'm done with college, be a role model for people in my community, bring honor to my family, and so on. If you're more on this independent mindset, which students whose parents went to college and often college professors and administrators are on, you'll say things like, expand my knowledge of the world, become an independent thinker, explore new interests. 
explain my understanding of the world. And so how does this kind of end up affecting students? Um, you see it when there is this uh, mismatch between the assumptions the student brings about what college is there to do for them and what college is about and what the, say, a faculty member, staff member think is um, college is all about. So let me just give an example to make it more concrete. I had a student um, come to me one time and say, look, I had to miss class because my cousin, my, my cousin needed me because he had to go to work and his childcare fell, fell through and so I needed to watch um, my nieces and nephews. Uh, this was a cousin, not his brother, not his own kids, right? Now, if you have a more interdependent mindset, this might make sense to you. That's like a legitimate excuse, right? That your cousin needed your help with childcare. Um, but if you have an independent mindset, you might think, like, why are you, why is your cousin needing childcare on you, right? Like, you should be focused on your own education. You should be focused on coming to class. So how we understand a situation like that is really affected in, in how we think about what the obligations and responsibilities are to the student, why they're in college, right? Um, and, and how we think about the importance to family and community. And so uh, that, that's also an important factor. And it became an important factor for Todd as well. He felt this failure to make connection um, with people in college and at his job. And we see this over and over again, the students from uh, low income backgrounds, uh, first in their families often find it hard to become and feel a part of the campus community. Um, okay, so the, those are the basic moves that I make in my book. And what I hope people will take from it is really reconsidering mobility as a good measure of equal opportunity. I think that we put a lot of onus on mobility um, and I'm not sure that, that that is the best way to go. In fact, Rash Chetty, whose work I greatly admire, but what he's done that has um, been somewhat controversial is give a mobility scorecard, right? So now you can go on and see, depending on the college and university you are, how well you're doing on mobility. And even the New York Times recently had a, like a thing you could go on and check all of the different things that matter to you about the college and get your dream college output on the other end. And one of the things is mobility, right? And so we're, we're thinking about mobility a lot as an alternative for, for thinking about um, opportunity. But I think what we need to do is really reconsider this narrative, both for strivers and for institutions. So let me say a little bit about uh, strivers. In the book, I argue that we should empower strivers with clear-eyed ethical narratives that acknowledge the costs they're facing situate them in a broader context and help students think clearly about the trade-offs required for mobility. Um, so I think having honest conversations with strivers is the best way to empower them to make choices that are meaningful to them and that allow them to protect the ethical goods that they really care about and not end up, as many of the strivers I talk to, end up down the line saying, I wish I hadn't sacrificed my connection to my family or my community in this path. I wish I had been more mindful about trying to retain that connection. So I think we need to think, help students think more clearly about the different values that are at stake and what matters to them and why. Um, so I'm gonna tell you one more story of Kimberly, who is one of the first people I interviewed for the book, actually, and she was, um, uh, just this astounding young woman. Uh, she grew up in Ohio uh, in, uh, um, her, her, with her mom and her grandmother who were immigrants from the Caribbean. Um, she did really well in school. She was in a magnet program. She became the first person in her family to go to college. When she left college, she went to Teach for America, did that for a couple of years. And then she went on to uh, consulting, did that for a couple of years. And then when I met her, she was at Harvard getting both a public policy degree and uh, a master's degree in the public policy school and, and then the business school. And she was like trying to figure it out. She was torn between what to do. But what was remarkable to me about Kimberly wasn't that story, though that's a very nice story of mobility, but it was that she was so clear about what mattered to her and what her values were. 
So I asked her at some point, you know, so do you find some kind of sources of disconnection or cultural disconnect with the other students at Harvard? And she was like, oh yeah, definitely, right? So they um, often for spring break, she said, they would say like, let's go to Iceland. <laughs> She's like, I can't afford, I mean, she had worked for a number of years in Harmony Safe Club, but she's like, I can't afford to go to Iceland. I have to take care of my mom. And her mom had lost her job at some point. And so this is what Kimberly said. So she said, I think Americans in general are a lot more individualistic. I would never put my mother in a nursing home. She would live with me. She was living with me in Texas after she lost her job. It's not a question, you know. I had friends try to say, oh, you don't have to do this. No, I don't think so. You take care of your family. That's number one. I wouldn't be where I am if my family didn't think that, if they didn't put all their money together and were house poor so I could get an education. And what was remarkable in talking to Kimberly about that is that she didn't have shame about that. She was very clear about what her values were, what the lines were, right? So when people were like, you don't have to help your mom, like, just go to Iceland with us. She was like, no. <laughs> You, 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 you don't get it, right? She, that value was really important to her. And she was very proud of where, what her values were and very willing to defend them when she was being pushed by her peers and other people in this environment to give up on them. And so I think of Kimberly as a model of having this very clear ethical narrative. What are your values that, what are the values that you care about that are like your, where you're going to draw the lines, right? When the institution and the people around you are kind of pushing you to be different, right? To think about this stuff differently. And she was very clear that she wasn't willing to do that. And I think that's an important skill that we could give our students, right? To think very clearly about their values and where they want to draw that line. I think more generally, when I step back from thinking just about the situation of strivers, we know um, that we have made it incredibly expensive for those who are born into this advantage to access opportunities, pursue their own individual flourishing without sacrificing the tight bonds of family and community, right? And part of the reason we've done that um, goes back to the three factors I talked about, the ways in which educational opportunities are often segregated, so we don't find educational and career opportunities that propel you to the middle class in low income neighborhoods or communities. They're often at a distance, so that's geographic. But I think more concretely, um, we also have uh, made it so that um, students often feel like they have to be there for their families and supportive, and when those families don't have the safety net they need or are in poverty or need help with childcare or elder care, students feel um, like they want to help those people they love and be there for them, but that means often sacrificing their own individual and um, flourishing. Um, and whatever choice strivers make, they feel like they, they um, in a way, have, have lost something meaningful and valuable. So I think we should reconceive of opportunity. I think upward mobility is not the key to equal opportunity. It, it might be a useful and perfect metric, we can use it to evaluate some limited gains, but there are high costs to a system designed to increase it. I think what we should be after is a system of educational opportunities that lifts us all, and I think such a system would not focus on mobility, but on the flourishing of all who are touched by it, in particular families and communities, right, who so often invest so much of their resources on the hopes of the talented few who are going to get to move up. Um, uh, so, so we see this also in sociological research that uh, in, in particular, for example, in rural communities in the U.S., rural uh, communities um, in which there might not be a lot of opportunities for upward mobility because, you know, we have rural towns that are becoming smaller and shrinking and have fewer opportunities, a lot of resources go into those students who have this chance of making it, right? But what do those students do? They leave. It makes sense. Given the incentives, it makes sense for them to leave. But that community invested a lot of human capital, if you want to put it in that way, uh, a lot of labor, a lot of love into students who are then um, incentivized to leave that community. Um, and, and we don't really talk about what happens to the people who stay behind. Um, so, so that's kind of the big takeaway message of the book, and I'm looking forward to your questions um, and comments. Thank you.
I'll speak. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome again. Um, we are live streaming this, and so if you have questions for Dr. Morton, we ask that you use the microphone. And so, who's first? Be brave. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this. I found it absolutely fascinating and important. So as a professor here who has students like this and having been a first generation student myself, I guess my question to you is, what can we do? You know, <laughs> what can I do as a professor in, in a class where I have students like the ones that you describe? Yeah. What do I say to them? What, what, what are the sort of concrete steps I can take? You know, yeah. I know there's steps we need to take as a society, but what, what can individuals do? Yeah, thank you for that question. So I'll, I'll answer that question in, in, in two parts. First, I'll say what to avoid, and then I'll say positively what to do. I think one thing that recurred in the conversations I had with other strivers was the sense that professors were negating the value of these obligations that they had. So there was a, this guy, Henry, who through college experienced a lot of depression, in part because his family was going through so much, and he was really wrestling with how much to help them, and it was um, leading to depression. And so he went to the counseling services on campus, and the counselor said, oh, but like, why do you feel bad about that? Like, you have no obligation to them. And he said that was that moment where he thought, I'm never coming back, <laughs> right? And, I, and there's these moments where you think you're trying to help the student, but in fact, it can be this disconnect, right? Where then they don't feel like you understand them. And I saw this at CUNY a lot, and I did it at the beginning too, where it's like, no, it's better for you and your family if you finish your degree, which in some sense might be true. But if they're in a crisis moment with their family right now, it's not obvious to them, right? Because it's not obvious what to do. If you know a parent is like, going through some medical emergency and really needs you and you also want to do well in school. It's not clear that in that situation there's an obvious answer. So I think more like listening to the student rather than thinking you, you're going to try and fix their problem by saying, well, it's obvious what the thing to do is here. More concretely in the classroom, I think we often don't think of the classroom as a place where students can forge new connections. Again, I don't think those new connections make up for the things the students lose. But it does make them feel like they have other sources for those relationships that are meaningful to our lives. And often, students find it hard to find those connections outside of the classroom. So the social space of college can be very stratified according to class and race and stuff. But in the classroom, you actually have the power to make students talk to each other across those boundaries, right? Um, and you have to accept that students might hate it. Like that's um, right often like group work and, and talking to each other is something that students sometimes really resist. But that's where students might find connections that they might not find outside of the classroom because they're working on a group project with another student and that leads to them chatting and whatnot. And, and so one thing I've been really trying to push when I talk to people who are in, the role of being professors or teachers is that the classroom can also be a space where you allow students to form those connections that so will fill them, make them feel more connected to the college campus, and that's more able to succeed. Um, and, and so it's not just about transmitting knowledge, it's also about having students find community in your classroom. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I loved your story and what you were telling, and so, sounds like you were reading my book uh, <laughs> of my life. But um, one of the things that, um, and my name is Gloria Murray, I'm sorry, I'm from, um, I'm a retired professor from Indiana University Southeast. And um, one of the things that I've found that for some reason, even on college campus, professors are, they tend to want to keep their lives a secret. Mm. Um, I believe in story. Yeah. I believe that as a professor, whatever your story is, you need to tell it. Yeah. Um, and you need to let people know, especially what you, you said about your own life, and let them know where you came from. Because yeah. not everybody came from wealth that's a professor, as we all, most of us know that. 
Um, why not tell our story? Why not discuss yeah. the struggles that you've gone through in college and your life experiences? You don't have to tell all the details, okay? <laughs> um, but you can tell enough to have a conversation about this yeah. where a student feels comfortable coming to you and saying, you know, this is what's happening to me. You may not be able to solve their problem, but at least they have someone to talk to. So I believe in the power of stories yeah. and, and letting people know um, what's going on. Um, th the other thing I wanted to say too as I was listening, and I have tons of notes from what um, all of this, um, is that in many instances you find that, um, especially for, for black folks who end up leaving the neighborhood, leaving their communities and whatever, what ends up happening in my, in my experiences, especially here in Louisville, is that those that, that leave the city, leave the town, many come back. Some that don't leave are very engaged in work in those communities. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say enough about um, organizations, uh, I can only speak for about black folks, um, black organizations that are in communities that are trying to, and many of them have gone to college, they've had experiences, and they come back to their communities through organizations to try to help, you know, once again, be a part of that community yeah. again. So I think that thinking about that is another way in which uh, you help these students in college yeah. say, hey, have you connected with this organization or that organization as a professor, but you gotta know about what's going on in the community. And if you don't even know, you can't even tell the students yeah. about the organization. So for professors, it seems like you need to be out in the community talking to folks and finding out what's going on. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. Those are both great comments. I heartily endorse both of them. So on the first point, I do agree. It's so important to tell your story. And I, I'll just put a wrinkle on that, which is that I am very comfortable now telling my students my story and being, you know, I will tell, drop the hint. I don't necessarily start out classroom material. I'll say, oh, I'm a first generation college student. If you have questions about how the campus works or anything like that, feel free to come talk to me. And that definitely opens the door for some students. Um, so I do think it's important. The, the one wrinkle I'll put on this is that um, strivers often feel in a very vulnerable position, right? As you're making your way up, there's a sense like, I've worked so hard to get here, I don't want to lose my position where I am, right? And so you're combating two forces. One, the wanting to give back, because there's also, and research shows, a lot of uh, sense in particular from people who come from low income families that they want to give back, right? That they're not just interested for the most part in like, upward mobility, their own economic advancement, but the sense of like giving back to community, their community or communities like the one they came from. And at the same time, you also want to make sure that you don't lose this hard earned position that you've, you've worked so hard for. And so when thinking, for example, about faculty members, that can be really hard, right? Like outing yourself as a first generation college student, it really depends on the campus and the culture in your department. Like, how okay that is, or investing time in, uh, say, support services for, for first-generation college students, or being part of the first-gen or low-income student support services on your campus. Um, depending on like who else is in the room and who's making decisions about your tenure, that can really help me. So it's tricky, and I think it's not just tricky in academia, it's tricky in all sorts of other professions where you're constantly navigating, not wanting to lose the position you have while also trying to help and give back and, and change the structure. So that's something I talk a little bit about in the book, but yeah, it's so important. <laughs> I think that, yeah. Uh, oh, excuse me. Hi, Dr. Martin. Hi. Um, thank you very much for being here and uh, thank you for writing this book. It was something that really opened my eyes to a concept that I'd never really considered before and I think really helped me um, understand students in my classroom a lot better after reading it. So thank you oh, for that. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about this concept about cultural mismatch and yeah. how the rise of online education within higher education either helping kind of close that gap between these interdependence and individual factors or maybe even exasperating that gap as um, uh, people don't necessarily have that space to um, you know, leave some of those pressures that they have uh, from, from the interdependence standpoint or make connections in the classroom. So do you think online education is something that is going to kind of help or, or maybe yeah. even further exasperate some of these cultural mismatch things going on? 
Yeah, uh, so this is a question. Uh, yeah, this is such an important question. And I actually wrote something against online education many years ago, pre-pandemic. <laughs> okay, so, you know, and now the world has changed. Um, so here are my concerns about online education. Or let me, let me start with the pros. Um, and this is happening at CUNY now. I was just talking to some colleagues at CUNY where some campuses are having a hard time enrolling people in person and students want the online option, right? And they want the online option because they have long commutes, they're working, they have family obligations. It makes sense, right? It makes their lives easier in a lot of ways. Um, and so I do think like this experiment with the long, online education is really revolutionizing some college campuses and moving them um, into just online learning or mostly online learning. The reason I worry about that is that we know that part of mobility is this cultural component. It's basically figuring out how to interact with people that are different than the people you grew up with um, and that are in these positions of power, whether it's at a workplace, um, or uh, at the PTA or whatever it is, learning how to form those connections and make those friends and, and, and feel more comfortable in that space, even if you're never gonna feel entirely comfortable, depending on your background. It might be that you feel more comfortable navigating those spaces. And online education, it's really hard for it to give you that, right? It's really hard for it to give you that space to form connections and friendships ac across class boundaries and to know how to uh, navigate a space that might be very different from the one you grew up in. So if you're still in your own neighborhood with all of the stuff coming at you, right, and you're not going somewhere where you're kind of interacting with people that are very different, but there might be the people you interact with in a workplace, you might not have a chance to practice those skills. Um, and so I really worry about that. I also worry about the how students will be able to create those boundaries that they need in order to focus on education. Um, so just to take a really like small example, but something I struggle with and still struggle with, but when I was at CUNY, it was it, uh, attendance policy, right? So like, should I make attendance policy part of doing well in the class? Now, on the one hand, you might think that punishes students who have a lot of work obligations and family obligations. On the other hand, I heard from students themselves who said that a strict attendance policy gave them a good excuse they could offer their families when their families needed them to do X, Y, or Z. They could say, oh no, this professor's really strict. I cannot miss that class. Otherwise, I won't do well, which gave them the ability to like, put that boundary there that they needed to be able to do well in class. And which means, I mean, it, it's difficult then to figure out as a professor what you're supposed to do. Because on the one hand, you want to be understanding of how flexibility helps the students. But flexibility can also lead to students failing. Because if they stop coming to class and all these other obligations just step in and they're doing all the stuff for their family, then at the end of the term, they're like, oh, shoot, I haven't done anything for my class. And now I'm going to fail, and, which is the worst option. Yeah. transition here. Um, this is related to something I was going to say with what could faculty members do. Yeah. So the academic calendar is not as rigid as it, as it appears, right? And so there is some flexibility when people have crises that professors could do things with the academic calendar. But the yeah. problem is that deadlines are effective. And so, you know, if you extend deadlines for some students, it, that will be a recipe for failure as yeah. well. As it's yeah. Same. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Jose Fernandez. I'm the uh, chair of the economics department. Um, so yes, the economist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, my question is more from uh, a parent's point of view here. Okay. Um, you know, as strivers, since many of us are in this room we tend to do, uh, you want to put your children in the best position that you can, so you try to get them into these magnet schools and so on and so forth. Yeah. But uh, it, it kind of feels like I, I repeat some of the same things I went through with yeah. them and that they're like losing some of their Latinidad that yeah. comes along with it. Uh, and it makes me think of lots of other things out there. So speaking in economics, um, Roland Flyer had a paper about uh, the economics of acting white, for example, which includes some of these 
changes in behaviors, yeah. code switching, things of that nature yeah. that, that come along with it. And so any advice for, for oh, some that, of those parents in the room? That is the most <laughs> difficult question, I think. Um, wh one thing that, and I, may, I, I probably like lose a lot of you um, by saying this, but I think, and I'm saying this as a philosopher, attempts to have like moral purity by or justice you know be the just person by thinking about your own individual behavior in this way i think kind of misses the picture of what we need to do to address these issues so whether your school your kid goes to the magnet school or not right or you end up just sending them to the neighborhood school it probably won't change the structure of opportunity that's out there those changes really need to come at a much deeper level and so the way i think about this is should you, should you recycle? Yes, probably, right? That's like a good thing to do. Will your recycling actually change the climate crisis? <laughs> probably not. Um, and so we need to think bigger, right? I, 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 when I think about my child, I try to raise her with awareness of what's going on. Um, but I'm, and maybe this is because I am a philosopher, I hesitate to see my parenting project as one in which I'm using to like and achieve some social justice ends, you know, through through like where does my kid go to school or not? I I feel like in a way we need to think outside of that box that our own individual actions are the levers, but really collective action, I think is the way to think about it. Um, yeah. So that's not a very clear answer. I just think we're very limited as individuals in what we can do about some of this stuff. Um, and, and I think we're limited as parents by the structures that we find, right? Like what is Todd's mother supposed to do in that situation? Like should she not lie to get her kid into the school? No, I think it's totally fine that she lied to get her kid into the school that she needed to advance her own child's welfare. There were many other people in her neighborhood that didn't have that opportunity, right? who maybe didn't even have a friend with a zip code in a better neighborhood that would help them out. Um, and so I, don't, I think it would have been a mistake for her to think, well, I'm advantaging my own child. Over the, it's like, no, we need a school in their neighborhood that actually provides opportunities to go to college so that all those kids can, can have that opportunity. Um, so that's kind of a somewhat muddled answer, but I feel like it's such a tricky um, question, how we use our individual actions to leverage social change, and yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Morton, so glad that you're here, and I really appreciated the, the sort of the last part of the book where you delved into like building those ethical narratives, and I'm in the higher ed program here, it made me think about, oh wow, we could do all kinds of cool things in higher ed and like helping faculty and student affairs, like yeah. build those ethical narratives. Um, but one thing I thought you might have some insight on is something I struggle with in my own work is the assumption around social identities in mm -hmm. higher ed. We assume that like be proud about your race, be proud about your sexual orientation, right. be proud about your gender. But when it comes to this kind of issue of social class, it's like, no change. We don't want you to be proud. And like you talked about some of the, yeah. the people who felt that. And I, it feels like we need a new philosophy in higher ed of how we approach the idea of social class. And I'm curious what your thoughts would just be about what should we be thinking about? Yeah. What should we be doing around social class identity in higher ed? Uh, that's such, uh, yeah, it's an important question. And in a way, it cuts deep to the way in which America thinks about opportunity. Right, because we don't talk about social class that much, and many people don't uh, really want to address social class as a as an issue that has to do with your identity. Um, so I came, I grew up in Peru. I, I came here to go to college to the United States, and in Peru, social class is how we think about opportunity. Right. So as is the case in many European countries. So, for example, when there are like polls for political office, you know, there's the polls that come out in the paper. They're not divided by race as they are here. Um, they're entirely divided by social class and there's class A, B, C, D, E. And you know who class E supports and who class D, right? So it's all very thought through this kind of class system. But I, I do find that in the United States people have a lot of trouble talking about class and identifying as being part of a class. Um, 
And so I think it goes beyond higher education, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is that in general, everybody wants to say they're middle class, even people at the very top and people <laughs> at the bottom. Every, you know, and, and there's something kind of lovely about the idea that we all want to be in the same class, but in fact, your social class really determines your path through the college or career opportunities. Um, yeah, so, so I agree. It's, it's hard to think about how to build an identity around it when the identity outside of the college campus is very much saying, no, we're all middle class. That's the identity that's like very comfortable for very different people to inhabit and saying that you're from a poor or working class, which I guess is one identity people have, um, is contentious and feels, you know, so yeah. Um, and now it's like first gen has stepped in as that category, but actually first gen doesn't track class exactly. There are many first gen students who are wealthier and for, you know, so I don't know, it's a tricky one, but I do, I do wish we would talk about class more um, and we're just more explicit about that, yeah. Hi, Jennifer. I'm Sarah Hi. Lopez. We met last night oh, yeah, at the yeah. award Hi, event. Sarah. Yes, your daughter was a doll. It was <laughs> awesome to have her there, too. Um, so uh, I am the chief of staff to the provost, um, and I related a lot to the story of Kimberly, actually. Oh, My mother is yeah. from the Caribbean, specifically the islands off the coast of Honduras. And I also did Teach for America directly after oh, college, wow. and then yeah. went on up the ladder after that. Um, and really, the, it's more of a comment than a question and yeah. a connection, perhaps. My background in sociology, um, I saw a lot of ties with what you presented and just your whole concept as an educational philosopher, having a lot of ties to sociology. And one thing that my favorite sociology professor back at Center College always told me, who took an interest in the struggles that I was having and was trying to do his best to help me navigate um, the changes that I was, uh, go and challenges that I was going through, is he said, Remember to be careful who you make your reference group, Sarah. Mm, and reference groups being yeah. a part of the, one of the concepts we were learning in the class. Um, I think strivers especially become masters at code switching. Yeah. They become masters at learning what to wear, who to, what to say, who to connect with, how to say it, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And in that mastery, of, of code switching, you can start, you can almost fool yourself a little bit on who your reference group is yeah. because you're so focused and obsessed in a way with becoming more and more like yeah. um, that group. And I think maybe one of the, just to piggyback on two of the things that were already provided and what you also affirmed about getting students in connection with um, groups that they share similar interests with, similar backgrounds, that could help ensure that students are keeping lifelines to reference groups yeah. um, that are more similar maybe to their family background as much as it's also important for them to establish new connections and new uh, we are I mean we are we should be adapting I don't know that we should always think yeah. the right of firsts always is is king just yeah. because I started with this group doesn't mean it's the it's the only group that I can find meaning with and and um, Anyway, so reference groups uh, um, as a concept from sociology I think could really play well here as one of the yeah. ways that f professors and anyone choosing to be a champion for a student going through challenges like these could utilize in helping them stay connected with who their reference groups um, are. Yeah, so I, I love that. Thank you so much. I, yeah, I love that idea. Um, it makes me think of the story. I was recently at this panel for um, students from underrepresented backgrounds who were in graduate school, and they were thinking about graduate school. And a lot of the, pa I don't know, it was, a lot of it became students talking about challenges they had encountered and the ways in which the institutions had let them down. And there were other faculty who were also members of underrepresented groups talking about the same thing. And so it was all becoming very much of a downer, right? And one of the students raised her hand toward the end and said like, what do you guys love about your job? So the faculty, right, to come back and I said, you know, and I was thinking of the reference group. I'm like, I get to decide what to think about. I have tenure, I have benefits, and like an okay salary. I mean, from the reference group of like my grandmother who was a secretary and always struggled, you know, supporting kids by herself, it's just like a really good job, right? But uh, we got so caught up in the reference group being like other academics or 
academics who were doing better, right? That it, it became this sort of like failing to appreciate the thing that was good about what we were doing. So I like, I like that idea, because I, I do think it's sort of important to like choose carefully, otherwise you're constantly in the, the kind of the rat race, and you're thinking, well, I need to have as much as these people, I have to do as well as, yeah. Yeah. That's not, those aren't your people. So yeah. maybe you can connect with them and, and make it a, a new group, but don't forget the reference group to unnecessarily feel like an imposter. Yeah, yeah. Or like you're failing somehow, yeah. despite yeah. having a really good job. <laughs> Do you really well? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Hello again. Oh, hi. Um. <laughs> Uh, so in your book, you, of course, talk a lot about the um, costs that individuals face as they go through this path of upward mobility, yeah. but you also make it very clear that this cost is a two-way street, right? Yeah. That, that communities also yeah. bear this burden and, and suffer these costs of individuals uh, as they move up through upward mobility, moving out of these communities. So, um, of course, you can't cover your entire book in this presentation, right. but I just kind of wanted to ask you to maybe speak about that a little bit, because I found that to be a very important yeah. and factful point. Yeah, I, um, and, and as I was doing the research for this book, I was really thinking about the experience of students and, and faculty and students. Um, but more and more, I became interested in the relationship between strivers and their communities and their families because there was one such great variety in the ways in which families thought about um, their child moving up, right? Many were proud, as you would expect. Some were really conflicted. <laughs> about that, um, and some were outright not supportive, right? Um, uh, and then you see the same in terms of, I think, communities and how communities think about this. So there's this book, I'm like blanking on the title, Kafanas and is one of the authors, but it's, it's about this, uh, I think it might be in Ohio, the small rural town, um, and I kind of reference that toward the end there about how the community invested so much in the high achieving students uh, that they thought were like the promise of the small town. One of these rural towns was slowly losing people and really um, businesses shutting down and all this stuff. And they thought like, you know, the, the whole town was invested in, in the mobility of these few talented students who are then gonna leave the town and then there were the stayers, as they, as they call it in the study, um, which were the, the young people who really probably didn't have lots of prospects and leaving. And they were sort of almost like ignored by the educational system and by the town. Like they, they weren't college bound, right? Or they weren't going to go to Chicago or whatever it was. Whatever it was. So they were just sort of um, not really heavily invested in. And you know, when you read the, the ethnography, you're like, oh yeah, and, but yet yeah, these are the people that will comprise a community, right? Because those other young people are leaving. And so I think thinking about it from the flip side, what is the community losing? What are these families losing? And what resources are we giving them to make up for it or to think of other ways to revitalize the community? Um, and this is particularly true for rural, rural communities where the dynamics are very much um, there's an incentive to leave if you want a middle class job or an upper middle class trajectory. And the people who stay behind feel um, often like they had no options, um, which, yeah. Any last questions for Dr. Morton? There's one right there. At any point in time in your research, did you talk to people or look at the role that community colleges play in higher education? No, although I would have loved to. And I've been, um, I've been trying to do a project with the Community College of Philadelphia, but it's actually, um, I don't know if you know, a really tough time to be in the community college business right now. And so they're really, uh, enrollments have been down. Um, there's a, post-pandemic a really like lack of morale, you know, just because of the, the situation they're in. Um, some of the students I talked to, and many of my students at CUNY had gone to community college first. So CUNY has a nice system where you can go to community college and transfer into one of the four years 
Um, California has that system too. Um, so that was often a, a kind of a lifeline uh, for them. But um, yeah, I am very curious about the role that community college play, in particular in rural communities, where that might be the only educational institution that you can attend and stay home. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Dr. Morton does not have to sprint out of here, so if you'd like to come and say hello and thank you, um, please do so. Thank you, everybody, for thank your you. kind attendance and attention. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Thank you.